I know we're I know we're powerful. <laughs> and it we wasn't need to get directed. the others. Huh? It wasn't directed at you specifically. It was directed at the two Marias that I was talking to. Esta Maria. Esta Maria. <laughs> what are you going to do with all these Marias, right? That's right. right. <laughs> well, I'm going to change my name so I can fit in. I'm going to become Maria. <laughs> Maria, Maria, and Nora. Nora, Maria. <laughs> Shh, Mama. So my Sorry chihuahuas will be barking too. I just okay. want to say that Lola will be making a, an appearance. I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> yes. All right. Mine, are, mine speak and I are not are not uh, seen. Yeah, <laughs> ella está pero fuera de órbita está este ahora. No, she doesn't stop, uh, and I think it's just because it's really hot. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Where are you all coming calling from? So you're you're in California, Tania. Uh, where are you, Nora? Austin, Texas. Austin, I love Austin. I gave. Oh. Up yeah, I love, I felt, I, I don't, I'm not a big lover of Texas. I'm good. I'm not going to lie, but I like, but I like Austin and I like Houston. I like wherever our people are. <laughs> yeah. And Austin is a good city. It's, it's a good, in yeah, Texas, like we're probably one of the best. Verdad, Maria? Maria Rios? Maria, you're also from Texas? Yeah, yeah. she's in Austin. Austin. Austin as well. She yeah. has hosted Comadrazos in her home ah, several okay. times. Mm -hmm. With food, I hope. Absolutely. <laughs> Not in the last year and a half, but. <laughs> yeah. A lovely house. I, I've enjoyed Do you still live in the same place, Maria? Yes. A, yeah. a lovely little space. Thank you, Nora. And I look forward to hosting when things get more improved. <laughs> Very well, good. Yeah. Nivia, where are you? New York. Maria and I, Maria Ferrer and I are in New York. We're in New York. We're in New York. And where? I say, oh, yeah, bien. No, yeah. I can't hear you, Nidia. Nidia's having problems. Yeah, having problems. Yeah, Nidia. Terrible. Maria, help me, please. Yes, absolutely. Nidia is in Staten Island. Okay. And I live in Queens. Okay. Mm -hmm. the, home, the home of all that good food. That's Queens. right. Yeah. Didi Montoya, where are you? Austin, Texas. She said um, Austin. I, and um, Diana Bazooka también. And Diana Masuka And Karen, uh, Karen, of course, comes to us from Denver. Hi. Karen, are you there? Hola, comadres. Hi. There you oh, are. Oh, my. I don't know. There, there I, you are. <laughs> hit it twice. Yeah. Nice to see you all. That was a great interview. Uh, author interview of the teleconference on Monday. Yes, good. yes, that's we're good. Um, Karen helps us out on our uh, National Book Club. Mm -hmm. And she's in Colorado. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm in Denver. To, I'm heading to Denver in October. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I go to Denver uh, it, just for meetings. Yeah, <clears> for meetings. Yeah. But I like it. I like, I like Denver. So everybody's fit there. And I'm horizontally gifted and close to the earth. I just kind of feel, <laughs> oh. you know, like nobody looks like me there. <laughs> um, do Doris, you where are you from? Hello, I'm from California, Southern what? California and Laguna Woods. Okay. From the Inland Empire Group. Great. Nice to meet you. So she's with Terry. Mm -hmm. yeah, yes. Thank you for in, in, including us. It's awesome. Well, let's get started. And then as people come in, you know, we'll just let them know. So ladies, we invite you, comadres, we invite you all to uh, put your screens on, you know, so that Elizabeth can see you. So please put them on, but put yourselves on mute. Okay. Elizabeth will talk for about uh, 35 minutes, and then we're gonna open up to Q&A. Um, don't forget your question and stuff. If you can put it into the chat, we will you know, keep track of it. And, um, and so I would like to introduce you to Elizabeth Yampierre, Yam is Yam that Pierre. correct? Yampierre. And she is executive director of UPROSE. She is a recognized climate warrior and one of the world's most influential people in climate policy. 
Okay, so I'm going to, that's going to be my short bio. And Elizabeth, please tell sure. us more about yourself and tell us how, you know, we can do our part for uh, climate justice. Sure. Um, well, thank you so much for inviting me. It's an honor to be in community with you. And it's exciting to hear where you're all from, because most of you are from communities that are saturated with environmental burdens. And most of you have been exposed to the toxics and toxicants um, that have made it uh, so difficult for our communities to be able uh, to have a life that is free of the kinds of health disparities that affect our community. Um, I was born and raised in New York City. I'm Puerto Rican. I'm a Puerto Rican of African and indigenous ancestry. Uh, my mom came to New York when she was about five years old and my father was also very small. Uh, so it feels like I'm second generation. Uh, but you know, if you know anything about Puerto Ricans, you know we rip hard um, and that that flag is everywhere. It's our act of defiance against colonialism and uh, against US imperialism in Puerto Rico. Um, I was born and raised in a community that was, I went to five schools in eight years, uh, displaced as a child, uh, grew up in the midst of brownfields and in the midst of waste transfer stations and power plants and things of that sort. And so my family uh, has been exposed to all of the different kinds of uh, environmental hazards that communities that, are, that grow up in environmental justice communities have. Uh, COVID took the lives of about four people in my family and I almost went into cardiac arrest. This is what happened to our community specifically uh, because we knew that when COVID showed up that it was going to be EJ communities that would be impacted more than any other. And so here we are on a day when, um, and I have a talk, but I don't know if I'll stick to it just because I'm looking at your faces and it's a small group. So I just may completely go off and then look at it every once in a while. It's a little bit more formal. Uh, but here we are uh, in the middle of a heat wave. It's 97 degrees in New York and it felt like 106. Uh, we know that in the Pacific Northwest that there, there is um, a tremendous heat. My mom told me that in Miami, it was about 106 the other day. And so we are feeling uh, the impact of climate change. Uh, a report just recently that came out from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that was leaked out. Uh, specifically, if you read The Guardian, says that um, we are at the point where um, the life will be uh, a very different thing. Uh, it's going to look different, but that human beings won't survive. Uh, we are literally at that point where our survival is at risk. And so in the climate justice movement, um, we that which is I'm co-chair of the Climate Justice Alliance. It's a national uh, front organization made up of frontline leaders from Puerto Rico all the way to Guam, people who represent Indian country, folks that are involved in uh, mountaintop removal, fighting mountaintop removal, uh, indigenous people that are fighting pipelines, folks in the global south and, and the uh, Gulf South, people in Michigan. Literally, we have uh, oh, about 78 members all over the United States. Um, and we have members in Puerto Rico and Guam. Um, and these are frontline leaders that have been moving towards uh, what we call a just transition, which is moving away from fossil fuel extraction uh, to a regenerative economy and trying to create local livable economies. Um, we as a people, as people of African and indigenous ancestry. And I say that specifically because um, it is more defining of who we are than nationality. I think often that nationality is a creation of colonialism that pits us against each other and has us really sort of being competitive with each other instead of understanding that we are very much the same people who are in a lot of different places um, and that we show our culture as a result of the place that we grew up in, right? So not um, a lot, we have more in common than we don't. Uh, and so I, I like to talk about it in that way. Um, the climate justice movement is pretty much women led. It's mostly black indigenous women of color. Um, and we, we, are, we often think of ourselves as uh, the descendants of extraction, right? The descendants of colonialism, of enslavement. Um, and not only that, but it's been our land and our labor that has been extracted. And that's really shown up um, in all of the different kinds of systems that we know. Everything from learning disabilities, from exposure to lead and other kinds of contaminants, to whether our health, uh, whether we're able to sustain 
um, our health in the midst of something like COVID. Um, and so it's, you hear often that the environmental justice movement and the climate justice movement is intersectional. And they refer to it as intersectional because in our communities, we don't have the luxury of choosing between police misconduct, fighting against police misconduct and fighting for environmental justice. We sort of live at the intersection of all of the harm that has happened to our communities generation after generation. Um, but we're also multidimensional. The work that is being done by the climate justice movement is really shaping the landscape. We are passing legislation. I know in the state of New York, we passed the CLCPA, which is the Climate Leadership and Community um, um, uh, it's, an, it's a legislation that basically moves uh, resources to frontline communities for investments for infrastructure. And now uh, the federal government is mirroring us in doing what's called Justice 40 and trying to take 40% of the resources of the Department of Energy and a number of agencies to go to frontline communities so that we can engage in climate adaptation, mitigation and resilience and prepare our communities for a climate future that's already here. Um, and so we are changing legislation, we're building leadership, and we are literally transforming the landscape. If you're from Houston and you know that you're in a city that's surrounded by petrochemical industries, then you are more likely to have dioxin in your bloodstream, have a, a life that will be threatened by toxic exposure. If there's an extreme weather event in Houston, um, a lot of those chemicals, as you know, will be dislodged into the water, into the air, into the soil, into the buildings that you live in, and you will be exposed to that. Those contaminants, everything from PM 2.5 to NOx and SOx and other kinds of carcinogens, literally get lodged in narrow air passages of babies in utero to our elders. And so the justice piece for us is that there is a distinction or a difference between us and the environmentalists and the climate activists. The climate activists fight to reduce carbon. We care about co-pollutants because those are the things that kill our people. So we don't just wanna reduce carbon. We also want to reduce co-pollutants. The environmental activists care, think about trees um, because they care about conservation and open space. We think about trees because they're the lungs of our community and they eat up all of the particulate matter and all of the pollution that harms the health of our communities. So our priorities are a little different and how we approach it and how we organize is also different. Uh, people mix those, they, 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 they confuse us, and they don't understand that justice is really about the disparate impact on communities of color. And it also speaks to the fact that we speak for ourselves, that we have the solutions. Like remember who you are as comadres, think about your ancestors, think about your abuelas. Our people have always lived within their carbon footprint. We've always honored mother earth. Um, and so we are not the people who are contributing to climate change, corporations um, and folks that have a lot of resources are contributing to that, but we are going to be the ones that are most impacted. Um, so it's important that that difference is understood. Um, climate justice really operates at the intersection of racial and social rights, environmental and economic justice. It focuses on the root causes of climate change and calls for a transformation to a just sustainable community-led economy. And so you can have a sustainable uh, community or a sustainable economy, but without the word justice, it really is green colonialism or a green patina that could really mirror the kind of process that put us in the situation that we're in, we were in before, if it doesn't include a justice as that. Justice is what really makes sure uh, that our community, that racial justice and equity is centered. And like resource rights, climate justice also means that those most impacted offer the most effective solutions. And that's the reason that when we were opening, I was talking about the folks at Tejas and the framework about a just recovery and how we can engage in a people to people recovery, because if God forbid there's an extreme weather event or something happens that makes it impossible for uh, so for the city's resources to come to you, we're going to have to depend on each other. And what does that look like, right? What does that look like in community? Are you able to share food and water? Are you able to take care of your children? Are you able to create pop-up schools? We're going to have to figure out what happens if there's that kind of disruption. 
And for our frontline communities, the solution starts with defending lands and rivers from mines, power plants, mega projects, and industrial agriculture, and expanding agroecology, transformative econo economies, and building community controlled energy and food systems. Uh, just this week, as I mentioned before, the heat waves across the Pacific Northwest warnings for early hurricane season. There's also the continued fight for clean water, for clean air, water, and food as a right and not as a privilege. So we're in this deep moment right now of reckoning. And like climate change, the conditions for our communities are the consequence of this long history of extraction. And we share, all of us, you know, particularly those of you that are in this room, we share legacies of fighting colonialism, as well as race, class, and gender oppression while advocating for environmental justice. But we also share vision, values, and principles that guide our environmental, economic, and social justice organizing. Um, so if you think, well, one of the things that we often say is that the climate crisis is a racial justice crisis, that it is the exacerbation of all the historical harm done to Black, Indigenous, and people of color and sustained over time. We know climate change is violent, it's unpredictable, it is disruptive. And when you think about it, think of Hurricanes Katrina, think about Hurricane Andrew, Superstorm Sandy, Hurricane Maria. And I have not stopped thinking about the devastation of historical black communities in New Orleans. I don't, I think about them because what happened in Houston and what happened in New Orleans was that after the devastation, people were displaced. And then all of a sudden, a lot of the environmental and transportation amenities that those communities deserve for a long time were invested in as those communities were promoted for, um, for gentrification. So um, and we saw the same thing happen in Puerto Rico, right, where, um, where suicide among teens skyrocketed and the bodies of my people uh, who have the highest asthma rates in the world were piled up in backyards. Um, and during Maria, and this is an important lesson to think about what happens in the case of disaster, uh, during Maria, national nonprofits um, from the United States and predatory developers parachuted into the island. And our addiction to celebrity and our hunger for representation made us look the other way. So if you are watching In the Heights, or if you're watching anything by Lee Manuel Miranda, or, or celebrating the Hispanic Federation, now, I want you to know that they're bringing Nestle to Puerto Rico to produce coffee and privatized infrastructure instead of supporting local farmers and investing in frontline solutions. Um, we found that after Hurricane Maria, that students wanted to go to Puerto Rico just like they wanted to go to New Orleans for a learning experience instead of supporting the students that were impacted in Puerto Rico. So when we think about climate change, we think about disruption of everything, the entire fabric and what people need in order to survive and, and in order to thrive. You know, it's an unconventional threat that demands in unconventional thinking and approaches, and it forces us to rethink our relationships with each other and conduct an internal audit of our own institutions to assess whether or not they're up to dismantling the systems that are born from extraction. So these things are important and they're different because they're forcing us to think outside of the box and it's scary. And you should be a little afraid of this because it, you know, we've had, I'm in Brooklyn and we've had three tornadoes. The first one scared people. The second one, people were like, oh, okay, I think this is climate change. But by the third one, people had already thought of it as normal. And think about what happens in Brooklyn if there is a tornado. It's not Kansas, it's gonna hit something. In my community of Sunset Park, we've got 130,000 people in just one neighborhood, right? Um, one neighborhood, that's the size of cities and other places. It's densely populated. We're right in the middle of an industrial waterfront community. Um, and so if there's a tornado, it's going to hurt people. Um, and we have extreme heat, which is the thing that is most likely to kill our communities. I have a lot of the health disparities that most people who grew up in EJ communities have everything from uh, diabetes to high blood pressure, all of the things, all of the things, despite the fact that I went to college, I went to law school, I try to eat healthy, I try to live a better life than my mother did growing up the way she did. I try to do all of the healthy things, but I inherited all of those health conditions and I lived and grew up in an environmental justice community. And so what does that mean for me? What does that mean for my aunties? What does that mean for your families um, when there is an extreme weather event that is going to bring out the worst in people? And what that means is 
the nature of people being competitive with each other instead of co collaborating with each other, which is what climate change is demanding, that we move away from traditional ways of assessing what success is, uh, from that nonprofit a mentality of competition and think deeply about what a collaboration really means. How do we complement the work that we do with each other so that we can be strategic in addressing the size of the threat? Um, and so I think we can just assume that it's here and that whatever it is that you're doing, whether you're a teacher, whether you're an accountant, or whether you're an organizer, what does that mean for you and what role can you play within your discipline uh, to address climate change. And, there, and, and and one of the things that happens with our communities, because our communities feel so, um, they already, they're already there in understanding that climate change is there. They want to know what they can do. We in Sunset Park, I just want to share some of the things that we're doing. We have launched the first community-owned solar cooperative in the state of New York. Uh, we uh, supported and made possible a $200 million investment in offshore wind so that we can um, bring in thousands of climate jobs locally. Um, we are talking about a green reindustrialization of our community, and that's really important. Think about Houston, for example. You've got all of these petrochemical industries that are making money while making brown communities sick for generations, right? So what does a green reindustrialization mean? If you shut down those industries, people lose their jobs and they basically have to choose between breathing, being healthy and putting food on the table. That is the conflict in communities of color. And so it makes it hard to tell somebody, well, you know, we need to shut down these industries and they're gonna ask, well, how do I feed my family? So that's what we call a just transition. How do we take uh, an industrial sector and repurpose it so that it is building for climate adaptation, mitigation, and resilience? How do we make sure that instead of extracting a fossil fuel, that they are working to provide renewable energy, to provide solar, wind energy, uh, to engage in food sovereignty, because food is going to be one of the things that are impacted. When we had COVID, people created a lot of mutual aid groups throughout the, throughout the country. And it was beautiful to see how people stepped up, supported each other, and were able to provide food to the most needy people in our communities. Climate change will also disrupt that. It means that the supply chain will be disrupted. And so we can't count on the fact that we will be able to pull all our resources together and feed each other because the food system will be disrupted. What that means is that we need to start thinking about mapping our communities and looking at where do we grow it? How do we share it? How do we make sure we have access to fresh water? Is that building a bioswale? Is that engaging in, in, in water harvesting? How do we make sure that our rooftops are cool? Maybe all we need to do is paint them white to reduce uh, the temperature and to make them warmer in the winter and cooler in the summer simple interventions that make it possible for us to survive extreme weather events. Can we connect each other's backyards and build block to block organizing? I think this is probably more possible in a place like Austin than it is in a place where people are far from each other. And the solutions are not only local, but they're different depending on where you are. So one of the things that I've learned from traveling all over the country, that in New York City, we're up against each other. And you've got that one person on the block who knows everybody's business, right? She knows who's on a respirator. She knows who's hooking up with who. She knows who's on dialysis. Literally, that is your first responder. That is the person who can actually help just make bring the block together so that together they can start working on putting in systems that will help them survive if there's an extreme weather event. And the solutions are different. Like in New York City, one block is not like the other. So you can't have a cookie cutter approach to the solutions. You can have a block that has all federally subsidized Section 8 housing and another block that has high rises and another one that has auto salvaging shops, right? So with the auto salvaging shops, because they're sort of these businesses where people don't have a formal education, uh, but are making a living, and environmentalists would love to shut them down because of the chemicals they use, not us. We don't wanna shut them down because 
These are working class people that are trying to make a living. So what we've done is we've taught them how to make their space climate adaptable, how to containerize their chemicals, how to work in a way that is environmentally sound so they pretend they're, they protect their workers, they protect their space and their neighbors, and so that they can continue to thrive economically. It's a different approach to addressing the challenges and the threats to a really small economy. And in Sunset Park, there's about 90 of those businesses, right? Um, and so it really requires that you know your community really well uh, and use different kinds and create different partnerships, non-traditional partnerships. So it could be faith-based communities and it could be small businesses. It could be larger businesses that are willing to work differently with community, but always organizing on the ground. The other thing that is really important in addressing this threat of climate change is that we be leaderful. And when I say leaderful, what that means is that the size of the threat is so big that it's not like the 60s or 70s where people would pick an iconic leader that would speak for us. This is leaderful. It means that there is room for everybody to shine and that people share power and resources with each other. It's really thinking differently about what power looks like. And it also has to be intergenerational. Intergenerational is easy for us because as a people, we've always been intergenerational. There are always young people engaged in exercising leadership in our organizations and really meaningfully engaged. They can't wait 20 years from now to learn what it took us 20 years to learn. And so we have to be generous in sharing with them what we've learned, what we've learned about reading a room politically, what some of the challenges are when they're meeting with elected officials and how they're going to get played so that it, because there's just no time to lose. And the other thing that we need to do is approach climate change with tremendous amounts of humility. It is vast and it is big and it is complex. And so young people know things that we don't know. Uh, I know that I'd like to think that I'm pretty cool and that I know how to navigate my way through social media and a lot of different systems that I didn't grow up using. And I think that's because in my organization, there are young people on our staff, on our board, they are integrated into leadership. They're not part of a youth program where we say to them, oh, what do the young people think? And we patronize them. We have a tendency to infantilize young people and then expect leadership from them. Um, we should expect brilliance from them and we should expect them, and, but we also have to level the playing field, which means introducing them to things like decision making and de deep democracy and, and um, understanding climate change. When they are learning about climate change at our organization, they're learning about geography, they're learning about math and science, uh, they're learning about and they're thinking about different career paths that they may not have thought about in the past. We are exposing them to the complexity of the threat and the accessibility of all of it. So they're working with planners, they're working, we have a community scientist on staff. Uh, our staff and our board looks like our community. We are black, indigenous, women of color, Puerto Rican, Guatemalan, Chinese, all of the things, all those things, um, we're absolutely amazing. Um, and so, all of us um, are women who come from struggle. Uh, we come from working class backgrounds. We may be probably the first in our families to have access to an education. And so our young people see themselves in power. They see themselves in leadership because they're not being talked to by people who don't look like them. Um, they participate in meetings. So yesterday, the Secretary of Energy was at our organization. She came uh, to talk to us and we wanted to share with her what frontline communities are doing to transform the lines, landscape, whether it's finance, uh, whether it's pre-development costs for renewable energy, um, what we are doing to do that and why the federal government, instead of investing in false solutions that turn our communities into sacrifice zones, why they should be investing in frontline leadership. The truth is that by 2042, we will be the majority in the country. And we will be the majority at a point when climate change will be having its way with us. And so even our communities are addicted to this idea of, um, you know, they believe in the American dream, right? They came to this country because they believe in the American dream, but the American dream is a capitalist extractive dream. And that dream is literally killing the planet. And so what that means is that we need to be engaged in educating our base and educating our people to reclaim their traditions, to honor Mother Earth, to remember what their grandmothers taught them about how to grow things and how to take care of the planet, how to have medicine that is available 
from our backyard. The things that we dismissed when our people came to this country because they thought that being American and being successful was to be to throw things away. Um, I don't know about you, but my grandmother always had like this kind of butelo and there was always something growing in the kind of butelo. And, you know, clothes, if they ripped, if they were old, they were fixed. Shoes were sent to a cobbler. It was a different way of growing up. It wasn't like we were constantly buying new bags and new things. And if you grow up not having things, of course you want things. I love, love, love accessories, right? So, but what climate change is telling us is that we have to live with what we need and not with what we want. And that we need to reclaim these traditions, these traditions of honoring mother earth that are part of our African and indigenous ancestry. So we actually know exactly what to do and how to build community. And we have unlearned that uh, as a result of being in this country and trying to become what an American is, which is someone addicted to consumption, culture, of throwing things away. Uh, but if we were to reclaim those traditions, we would be able to continue to live within our carbon footprint and have the skills that we have forgotten we had and share them with each other so that we can thrive uh, in the midst of climate change. So I wanna say that because often, you know, when I talk about infrastructure and I talk about policy and I talk about some of the things that we're doing to bring resources to local communities, people may feel a little powerless. They may think, well, I don't, I don't know how to do that. I'm not, I'm not good at that. And they don't realize that actually the answer is in their own home and their own backyard and in community with each other. Um, and so I don't want people to feel that this is not their fight. It is their fight. Um, and if you're from, Chicago, uh, by the way, in Chicago, one of the things that happens in Chicago was that there was a study um, that showed that when there was an extreme heat uh, episode several years ago, the people who survived were not the most privileged. It was working class people who knew each other, who were constantly having barbecues with each other, who were constantly looking out for each other. The communities that had social cohesion that actually were the ones that were able to look out for each other and survive. Um, this idea of being separate and apart from each other can kill us. Uh, and so I think as Latinas, um, you, that's part of who we are. We are constantly in community with each other. So I don't want you to be afraid of that. I want you to embrace those traditions and that history and that legacy of how we build family and how we build community and how we honor Mother Earth, because that is the thing that is going to help us survive. Um, you also have to challenge your elected officials. We've got elected officials who look like us. And the reason that we have elected officials who look like us is because struggle made it possible for them to assume those positions. And the minute that they assume those positions, they stop compromising justice. They stop, they lose their courage and they start compromising on things that you can't compromise. I think that climate change is also demanding a different kind of governance, what we call co-governance, which means that communities have to be partners in decision-making and that community is a brain trust of information and not people who should be managed or controlled, whose expectations should be controlled, but supported and elevated so that they are engaged in decision-making on a regular basis. These are not new ideas, but these are ideas that become more and more important uh, because of climate change. And so, so the reason that I share with you all of the different hurricanes and all of the different, different kinds of disruption that we are seeing happening right now as we speak is because there's no time to waste in doing an internal audit to figure out what is the role that we play individually, what is the role that we play collectively. If you are talking about housing, social services, taking care of the elderly, taking care of children, attending to children with special needs, whatever the thing that drives you, that gives you passion and purpose, it's going to be impacted by climate change. And so what is that going to look like? What is the role that you're going to play? Where do you get your information? Well, if you're in, um, if you look at the Climate Justice Alliance, you will be able to identify an organization that may exist in your city or in your community that will provide you with the tools that you need so that you can become meaningfully engaged. You don't have to start from scratch and you don't have to start a new organization. You can support the ones that are doing the work and amplify and make sure that more and more people are meaningful, 
in, meaningfully involved in that. Um, we have this tendency that when we have an idea, we want to create something new. That's the competitive in us. That's, that's the way we've been conditioned. That's how we define success. It's harder for us to step back and say, what's out there? How can I support it? How can I add value? And my organization, Uprose, which, by the way, is the oldest Latino community-based organization in Brooklyn. It was founded in 1966. I am not the founder. Uh, every once in a while, people ask me if I'm the founder, and I jokingly say that Botox is good, but it's not that good. Um, it's been around for a really long time. Um, but my organization has a lot of volunteers. Uh, we have a hydroponic garden. Uh, I don't know anything about gardening. I'm very urban but I love that people are doing it and that they're teaching me and I embrace that. Um, people bring different strengths and disciplines to the work and all of it is important. There are people who provide childcare, other people provide translation. Some people always like bringing food and collectively that's community. Um, the other thing that is really important uh, and I think because climate change is an existential threat and it frightens people is that we always begin by bringing people together around things that are not issues, like having salsa classes or having an art build, doing things that are about community building and healing. And in the process of engaging in all of those things, we introduce climate change and how they can, how they can get engaged. So like, for example, if you Google the People's Climate March 2014, the front line of 400,000 people march in New York City, that was made up of the young people from Uprose. And the young people from Uprose made the sunflower iconic for climate justice. And we did it because at that time, Detroit was being denied water. They were charging people for water. And we wanted Brooklyn to show solidarity for the city of Detroit. And so we opened with the sunflowers because we wanted to send a message that we have each other's backs, that we are not NIMBY, that we will not accept policies or amenities that will harm a neighboring community that is made up of our people. That's the movement space, right? So for example, uh, in New York City, when there was a solid waste management plan and they were saying, well, you know, New York City produces tons and tons and tons of waste, probably more than anybody on the planet, I'm not gonna lie, right? Um, they wanted to send the, the, the garbage to New Jersey. And we said, no, you can't send the garbage to New Jersey. And they're like, yeah, but it won't be here in New York, out of sight, out of mind. But our people live in New Jersey too, right? So what we said was that every borough had to be responsible for its own waste. That in New York City, 80% of all the garbage was sent to three communities of color, to Williamsburg, the South Bronx, right? Um, and we said, no. Um, Manhattan has to handle its own waste and we have to retrofit a marine transfer station. Brooklyn has to handle its own waste. Every borough has to handle its own waste. White folks went crazy in the Upper West Side, in, in, in the East Village, they went crazy. They didn't wanna to have to handle the waste. They wanted it to come to our communities. They showed up with their children saying we have, re think, they said things like we have real children as if we didn't, right? And so literally, I perceive the sighting of environmental burdens in our communities that serve the privilege as an act of violence. I see PM 2.5 like, like a bullet. It is an act of violence. And so, um, and so we organized and we passed legislation that now makes every borough have to handle their own waste. And they rolled in deep. They, they, could, they could empty out one building in the Upper East Side and it was made up of doctors and lawyers. Um, that's how deep they rolled in. So, so that thinking, also learning from other communities that have been successful in not only passing legislation, but have victories against developers those things are important so that you don't start from scratch. I think, I think that what I'd like you to come away with is understanding that you have power, that literally um, you can transform not only your landscape, but you could change people's hearts and minds, that they, once they understand their culture and they celebrate uh, difference and they make space for all of us to come together with solutions, that we can begin with small projects and bigger projects that are impactful. And that we don't need other people to lead us and to tell us what those solutions are.
And one of the challenges that we have as a movement is that the big greens, what we call the big greens, EDF, NRDC, the Sierra Club, National Wildlife, have millions and millions and millions of dollars. And studies have shown that despite the fact that they are well-heeled and well-resourced and we're not, that we are actually more impactful than they are. Every legislation that you're reading about and hearing about right now, whether it's the Thrive Act or the Green New Deal, has our fingerprints all over it. We have centered racial justice and equity in all of it. Literally, the structure has changed so that at a national level, all of the legislation, all of the initiatives are being shaped and informed by what happens on the ground and by frontline leadership. Years ago, those things were developed by, by grasshops organizations that sort of decided what was in the best interest of our communities as if somehow they knew more than we do, uh, as if somehow they were the experts and we were the passive recipients of their good intentions. A kind of green missionary uh, thing that we completely find unacceptable. And so we've rejected that. And we're basically saying that if they want to make a commitment to anti-racism, to being allies in this work, then they need to ask us, what do we need? And that we're happy to work with them, but they need to ask us, what do we need? And we will tell them. And then they need to do an audit and an assessment of what their resources are and how those resources can support frontline led solutions, that it doesn't happen with them speaking for our communities and diminishing and creating a state of climate apartheid in our communities. That idea that somehow they're the experts and they know everything is completely unacceptable to the climate justice movement. The truth is that if you're looking at the Americas and the cooperatives that are being created in the global south, people know exactly what they need. What they don't get is the resources to do it. And they don't get it because of white supremacy because there's this assumption that if there's an environmental organization that is led by white men, that somehow they know more about what to do when it comes to infrastructure, energy, renewable energy policy than we do. And we know that that's not true. Um, we know that, think about who we are for a second. I, I, I'm gonna share this story with you because I think it's really funny. My first year of law school, my first year of law school, uh, I. Uh, the professor is talking about the median LSAT score. And this girl is, and I'm the youngest one in the class, and this girl is sitting next to me, and she is the great granddaughter of a Supreme Court justice. And she looks at me and she smiles and says, what did you get on the LSAT? And I remember saying to her, you know, my mom cleans apartments and my father is in prison and I'm gonna kick your ass in class. You wanna ask me the only irrelevant question because you wanna put me in a spot, I said, watch how we do circles around you. Because you come from a place of privilege and you've achieved this, and I come from a place of struggle, and I'm where you're at. And that has got to intimidate you. Watch what we do. So I want people to feel their power because if you think about what our ancestors have gone through, if you think, if I think just about what my grandmother went through was she had 13 children and lost half of them because of U.S. extraction in Puerto Rico because they were moved to the worst, um, something the, to the equivalent of a favela in San Juan where they died from disease and hunger and my grandmother came to the United States with what was left of her children. When I think about how my grandmother came to the United States without being able to speak English and sat there and taught me political lessons about how you honor the front line, how you honor the people, how my education uh, is supposed to be used to lift and honor my people, um, there is no way that I can feel like less than, I'm not better than anybody. And I have benefited from the struggle of my family and from others who came before me, but I am not less than. And so no one in this space is, and so you have to feel your power. The truth is that there are no rights in this country that didn't come from struggle. There are opportunities and benefits that exist all over the United States because this is indigenous land that was built by black people and sustained by immigrants. And so we have all played a role in making this a livable country, a country that was literally built on pillaging and extraction and literally uh, on the backs of people of color. So we have no reason 
uh, to feel less than anybody else. We should feel like we owe it to our ancestors and to our families to step into power and really redefine what the future of this country looks like. And it has to be based on deep democracy. It has to be based on the spirit of co uh, collaboration on what we call a feminist economy. And I would ask you to go to grassroots Global Justice Alliance to learn what a feminist economy is and to go to movement generation so that you could learn what a just transition is. Um, I don't expect people to know what these terms are. We are learning them and inventing them as we go along. A lot of the things that we're doing, which is transformational, has never been done. And just because it hasn't been done doesn't mean that we don't imagine it and we don't create it. There was never a community-owned solar cooperative in the state of New York. We didn't know what we were doing. We had a vision and we said, let's do it. Let's find people and let's create it. We defeated um, Industry City, which is a multi-million billionaire connected to Amazon developer in Sunset Park that wanted to take the industrial sector and use it for high-end needs. Um, they bought in all of their resources. They dropped money in the pockets of local community-based organizations who you know will give up their spirit for just some trinkets. Isn't that the history of our people, right? And they said to us, you're not gonna win. And I said, well, you don't know about us. And for seven years, we fought and we created an alternative plan to theirs that was based on 10 years of community-based planning. And we organized and this past year, we defeated them. It had never happened. In fact, they've been having meetings about who are these people and how are they doing this? And in defeating them, we opened up the industrial waterfront for what was possible, which is, food sovereignty, how do we use our waterfront so that we can connect with economically depressed upstate farmers who don't like us because we're people of color. So we can incentivize their economy, build social cohesion and provide fresh food to people in New York City. How do we bring offshore wind and do all of these things that are, that are things that people dream about, right? People think offshore wind is so big, how is it gonna come to New York? So now that we have it coming to New York and it's coming on ships from Europe, we learned, for example, that it would be coming on ships that operate on diesel. And so the question was, is the climate solution going to become an environmental justice problem? Are we going to have these ships parked on our waterfront dropping tons of emissions into our lungs while we have access to renewable energy? So we said to the company, you can't do that. And so when they get to the Verrazano Bridge, it becomes electric, right? And then we started to look at the supply chain. What does a carbon neutral supply chain look like? So we have organically learned about all of this. I didn't study environmental policy. I never took an environmental class in my life. I am by training a civil rights lawyer. And my mom says that, um, that I am just, you know, an activist by birth, that I came out with the fist first, right? So that's how I manifested. I manifested as a warrior, right? Um, but what I'm trying to say is that um, it doesn't require you understanding um, or taking classes in all of this stuff. It requires you knowing what is necessary, being open to bringing in people who could provide you with the technical assistance and support and being fearless about moving to operationalize a just transition and a different economy that will honor people and the planet. And that means that, um, that means that you are approaching an issue that is as complex as this one with tremendous humility. And, and humility because you have to accept that it's hard, that we don't know everything, but that collectively we have the answers. And so that power of the collective is necessary and that it's frontline led, that it's women led. And I say women, not to diss any of the men. I have five brothers, a husband and a son. Let me just say that. A lot of men in my family. But there is a way that women organize that is fundamentally different. We provide food, childcare. We think in terms of circles and engaging each other. And that honors our ancestry. Uh, we're not competitive with each, with each other unless we've been trained to be patriarchal. We make decisions very differently. And so because of that, we are impactful. So I invite you to join us in doing this necessary work uh, and happy to provide you with resources and to connect you with people if this is a path that you want to be engaged in. And the path to climate justice is local. And so you have all the answers that you need. And I hope that since I went off my notes, 
I hope that you want, that, that I've been able to be clear about what climate justice is, what environmental justice is, and the role that you can play in not only transforming your community, but making sure that they are leading uh, in decision making in the communities that you live. So gracias por la oportunidad, and I'm happy to answer any questions and to have a conversation with you. Well, we have a couple of questions in the chat. Okay. Um, this one is from Didi Montoya. Didi, do you want to ask it? Didi? Oh, here, I'll just read it. Um, oh, her mic doesn't work. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, hang on, let me find it again. Um, how can communities and the scientists or professionals who may not be representative of the communities affected develop relationships to work together and share information, et cetera? That's a great question. I served on the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences and it was my, one of my responsibilities was to educate scientists about community science, about uh, supporting um, uh, the collection of data and the collection of uh, baseline data on uh, whether or not soil is contaminated, uh, whether or not you're living in a sick building. A sick building would be a building that has mold uh, because it's been exposed to a lot of, a lot of um, hurricanes or a lot of rain. Uh, it could be lead, right? Uh, and so it's really important um, that scientists get out of their ivory towers and connect with communities in a way where they're making the science accessible at a community level. Uh, we see that universities, for example, get a lot of the resources and then they literally bring in people in the community. I'll give you an example, NYU got a $700,000 grant uh, and then invited us uh, so that they can pick our brain for two years for $1,000. And, um, and we said, no, we're gonna share power and resources here because you wrote us into the grant. You told the National Institute of Health that you had consulted with community, but you had not. We're doing the work on the ground and you're going to use our brain trust and the work that we're doing to raise money that has to change. Universities can play an important role and we work with universities that honor and respect the front line and work with us as real partners. And so um, whether it's scientists, whether it's people in the university setting uh, who need to use the community so that they could get tenure, you have to demand that they work with you in a way where there is shared power and resources. And that includes scientists, telling scientists what you're doing is important these are the challenges and this is the way that we want you to do it and you can do that and you can use and there are models that will help you um, develop the demands that you need to develop in order to make those to make those requests from scientists but scientists can't even scientists understand that if they continue to talk to each other and stay in their ivory tower that they will not be able to address climate change and so they are rethinking what community engagement really looks like so that's a really great question. Mm -hmm. So um, is climate justice the same as global warming, global warming, or is it part of it? Global warming is what's happening to the planet. It's what you're experiencing today and you've been experiencing all week. Climate justice is a solution. Climate justice is how we are building, uh, changing policy, changing the landscape and educating our communities so that they could survive global warming. We are at the point right now where we can't stop global warming. We can slow it down and we could try to create the kinds of economies that will help us to be able to adapt uh, to engage in adaptation, mitigation, and resilience, but we've gone too far, too long, and we're not going to be able to stop it. Uh, so now it's just a matter of um, slowing it down, fighting so for what we call false solutions, um, and making sure that each community has a climate action plan. And a lot of times, climate action plans are created by the, gov by the governors without our communities at the table, um, and they will talk about urban areas, but they don't include rural communities at all. Um, and so they're very, um, they're very exclusive and don't have the decision makers uh, at the table. So you have to develop your own climate action plan. Um, so climate justice is the, is the frontline led solution. And it's not just here in the United States, it's in the global south, 
it's in the African continent, in Central America, in the Caribbean, in the Americas. Uh, communities all over the world are talking about climate justice. Uh -huh. um, anybody has any questions? Jump in. This is Gina. I'm at UTIL Paso. I'm wondering if you can expand a little bit more on the feminist economy and how you've seen it work. How, how do you, you know, what kind of examples can you provide of how it's been applied in different arenas in different communities? Thank you. That's a hard question. And the person and the people who can best answer that question are about 19 years old and they're in my office. Um, but it really is uh, a matriarchal way of thinking about community power. We uh, think about reproduction um, and we think about the cycle of how um, life is sustained by providing a variety of things, food, water, uh, care, and care for each other, right? So what does an economy look like that does that? Uh, really different from an economy that is built on extraction, that is built on patriarchy, that is built on capitalism, that really uh, makes it very difficult for people who are the most vulnerable to survive, right? A feminist economy really looks at who are the most vulnerable and all the different kinds of contribution that people bring so that we could create different economies of scale and we can care for each other when we are faced by these threats. It's a very different kind of economy. It's also the kind of economy that is gonna be necessary for us to be able to survive. And so it's different. Um, and when I say uh, patriarchal, I'm thinking about linear thinking about uh, the kind of top down decision-making where you've got um, people in our community um, waiting to see if they can benefit from decisions that are being made by other people. In, um, in a feminist economy, that's not the case. Uh, in a feminist economy, everyone has something that they can offer and collectively we are able to support um, care, a collective care for our community. Um, what I would ask you to do, Gina, is to go to uh, Grassroots Global Justice Alliance and um, they've got an enormous amount of information. We are members of the Grassroots Global Justice Alliance and, um, and they have been leading on this issue for a long time. They organize massive demonstrations all over the Americas. Um, they, um, that's how I met Belta Caceres. It was through the Grassroots Global Justice Alliance. Belta Caceres, if you don't know who she is, was a Honduran woman that was killed by the Honduran government uh, because of the environmental justice work that she was doing in Honduras. And um, the way that she approached the issue of environmental justice in Honduras uh, was from a feminist perspective. And so she had women organizing because what are we doing? We are really fighting for our children and their future. We're fighting for our abuelitas, right? And so our priorities are not, can we make money from this economy? Our priorities are, can we feed and clothe and educate our families? We are driven by different priorities. And so our systems come out of those priorities. Um, Clara? You had a question you want to ask? We can't hear you, Mama. It's not working? Okay, Clara's um, question is, um, do you work with the Nature Conservancy? No. Um, and so, so let me just say, the Nature Conservancy was created to engage in conservation to protect big open spaces, right? Um, and sometimes at the expense of indigenous lands, sacred lands, really without uh, respecting uh, the fact that some of those places were, um, were indigenous territory. And so they have a long history of racism and they have not been able to uh, pivot uh, to the fact that the demographics have changed and priorities have changed. In fact, um, one of the things that they're doing because racial justice and equity is being centered is that they're creating environmental justice programs and really helicoptering into communities where there's already environmental justice leadership, supplanting local leadership, uh, competing with local leadership, and then saying, let me give you a $25,000 grant, right? The trinkets, we're back to the trinkets, so that they can buy, they, buy, they can literally purchase the black and brown face uh, to the work that they're doing. 
They have never been able to change their culture of practice so that they can work with us in a way uh, that complements the work that we're doing so that we can work with each other in a way that really honors the leadership of our communities. We are open to working with all of those organizations as long as they are not engaged in white supremacy and as long as they are not helicoptering in our, in, into our communities and determining what our priorities are for us. The truth is that our communities care about open space. They care about wildlife. Uh, it is our communities that have on, always honored Mother Earth. But their history, and it's not just theirs, it's the history of the Big Greens, has always been this extractive, patriarchal culture uh, that, um, that has hurt our communities. And in this country, we need to be able to respect indigenous peoples from this country. Um, and so, um, you know, we are people of indigenous ancestry, right? So, um, so yeah, they have a long history of being, let me give you an example. I was giving a talk at the United Nations and the co-panelist was from that, that organization. And the co-panelist, I'm sitting there and he says, well, we are going into the South Bronx to do X number of things. And I turn around and I looked at him, I said, why are you going to the South Bronx? In the South Bronx, there is Nos Quedamos, Youth Ministries of Peace and Justice and The Point. And they've been doing this for many, many years. Did you contact them and did you ask them, how can I support the work that you're doing? How can I add value to the work that you're doing? Or did you just come in heavy footed to extract and supplant black and brown leadership in the South Bronx? And it's like, an, it's international. Everybody's looking at us and the guy's turning red and he's just like, oh my God, <laughs> oh my God. And I'm being rude. And I'm being rude because literally the survival of our institutions, the ones that are anchoring the work and doing it with, with little resources is at stake. It's at stake. And we have done tremendous things with, 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 a, with a scintilla of the resources that these organizations have. But because of Black Lives Matter and because you know racial justice is trending and their funders are telling them that they have to center racial justice, they come into our communities with their $25,000 grant and they try to buy street cred by making us the black and brown faces of a white-led agenda. And we're saying no. Absolutely not. That is not the way you build alignment. And that's not the way you commit yourself to anti-racism. We expect something more from that. And so, um, so the answer is no. Mm -hmm. Okay. But that um, doesn't mean other... we're not open. That doesn't mean we're not open, but they're going to have to change their culture of practice. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yeah, yeah. this is Angela Valenzuela. And uh, Elizabeth, you're outstanding. And thank you so much for speaking to us and your work it was extraordinary and everything that you say sounds very familiar as someone that works uh, intimately in the community in the area of education. I'm faculty at UC. I also taught a course on, on, cli on the uh, climate change uh, for one semester and it was very, very eye opening. And so I, I really would appreciate uh, being in touch with you and uh, having uh, any resources. So I, 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 can't, uh, I can't get stuff easily off of chat because I'm, I'm walking right now I'm outdoors <laughs> so if you wouldn't mind <laughs> if you wouldn't mind sending the the links I can't I can't keep keep it all in my head you might have it all in one place that, I will, that, uh, it's the climate justice alliance so I am executive director of Upros, but I'm co-chair of the climate justice alliance and we have members all over the country particularly in, in California and uh and the organizations are all phenomenal and they're all doing really important important transformational work and so um so it would be great if you familiarize yourself with the website it also has a lot of different tools a lot of frameworks that you can share with your students in your community and we have it available in different languages um we also have videos we have so much information if you think that something is missing or if there's something that you need all you need to do is let us know uh because if we are not accessible to our people on the ground then we are useless if we're having conversations that our communities don't understand i always measure whether or not i am being effective if my mom understands me right so if my mom can't follow me then i completely i completely miss the mark that's really important to me it's more important to me 
that my mom understands me and that the people in my family who didn't have access to a formal education, and I mean formal because our people are educated, right? Um, that's more important to me uh, than people who have had the privilege of, of a formal education because we need to do base building. We need to engage our communities in a way that's meaningful. The fact is that this is going to take us out and, uh, and our people need to lead on it. This is our, the human rights movement of our time. And so, um, so I would encourage you to, get, to check out the Climate Justice Alliance. I'd encourage you to check out Movement Generation because they have really cool and fun tools and Grassroots Global Justice Alliance. And, and, and once you check out CJA, which is the, the Climate Justice Alliance, look to see if there's an organization in your community that is a member uh, and find out how you can join and how you can support it. Uh, because we need to, we really need everybody. And, and there are no foolish questions. We're, like I said before, we're learning it as we go along. We're just fearless. We're just literally inventing the kinds of systems that we think honor um, our people and the threat. So, uh, so please, please check them out. Perfect. Y gracias de corazón, gracias mm -hmm. eh, por las palabras bonitas que expresaste. It means, it means the world to me. Mm -hmm. I so, wrote down all those organizations and I'm <laughs> going to find um, websites so that I can share them with everyone. Angela, you had more? Hmm. Well, the only, the only, um, you cut out mama. Yeah, she's walking, so she may have lost with, them. With, with, yeah. Without having heard the first part of your talk, I'm, I'm wondering if you're elaborating this idea of the solar commons. I mean, the sun should be free. The energy from the sun should be free, right? And people should be able, communities should be able to benefit from that. And I have a friend who's working on that in Minnesota with a project in, in Phoenix. So, I mean, I, I think that's a really neat direction to go Absolutely. in terms of just, you know, yeah, uh, local Absolutely. energy sources. Uh -huh. Yeah, we're talking about local ownership, community ownership, uh, even uh -huh. of the utilities. You know, I use Puerto Rico as an example because the entire infrastructure is being privatized. And there are celebrities like Lee Manuel Miranda who are participating in making it possible to bring in companies like Nestle to privatize our water, to privatize our agriculture, and to privatize the grid. Um, and so it's a form of disaster capitalism. And we saw, we saw that happening in New Orleans and the, Gulf, and the, and the, the uh, Gulf South. Uh, we're seeing it happen in Puerto Rico where people actually take advantage of a disaster and make a lot of money off the pain uh, of our communities. And we need to be, we need to be aware of that. Um, so the same people that were displaced as a result of Hurricane uh, Katrina ended up in Houston and then were hit by Hurricane Andrew. So, uh, so we need to make sure that we don't lose our communities and that, uh, that we're talking about uh, a green reindustrialization so that our people are not displaced, that we strengthen social cohesion uh, because it's, it's, it's brutal. It's brutal that they care so little about human life, but that doesn't surprise us. It's just that the, the scale of it is just, is just unbelievable. And so, uh, so we are well aware of what the threat is before and after disaster. And so we have to prepare for that. We can't let it get us uh, unprepared. Mm -hmm. No, no, very true. So I had a question if you don't mind. Sure, uh, Tanya. So I come, I, I work in air pollution. So I'll state that as a conflict of interest, if you wish, <laughs> or a particular bias. And so you talked a lot about local organizing, but of course, problems like air pollution are not local. They're really worldwide. And in fact, you know, Asia is the highest producer of bad air. And yet the West Coast receives it, you know, it's wind patterns, weather. And so my question is basically, what are your recommendations for, you know, problems that are not so local? I mean, I fully agree with you with everything local, but what about the bigger, more? So globally, we know that 40% of all of the carbon is coming from the United States and Asia. I agree. Uh, but I would disagree with you about uh, air pollution not being local. The truth is that uh, if you're talking about Houston, if you're talking about Sunset Park, uh, if you're talking about communities in LA or even Chicago that are surrounded by coal fired power plants or by fracking, we know that there are hot spots and we know that 
communities of color are more likely to be exposed uh, to air pollution than the more privileged communities that can leave the neighborhood, go to their house somewhere else. They have resources, they have access to better medical care, and they also don't have a long history of exposure to toxics and toxicants. Think about who we are, right? From the very beginning, we have had access to the worst food, the worst conditions, and so that legacy, the epigenetics, lives literally in our DNA. And so we're more susceptible, uh, not only to extreme weather events, but to the toxicity of these contaminants than more privileged communities are. So yeah, locally, there are hot spots and our communities are the most impacted. Uh, because environmentalists like to say that air travels and that we're all affected the same. The truth is that science will tell you that we are not affected the same. Now, globally, there is a global responsibility to force the United States to take responsibility and Asia to take responsibility to how they're contributing to climate change. And so what is happening right now is that nationally, the United States and some of these members, these people who go to the COP are supporting what are called false solutions. They're talking about uh, carbon sequestration. They're talking about green hydrogen, these kinds of interventions that are unproven, they're untested and will make and continue to make our communities sacrifice zones. And we know that there are natural interventions that will reduce carbon and address air quality that are not being explored because it's corporations that are pushing these false solutions. So not only did they put us in this situation that is killing the planet, they also wanna benefit from the interventions that they're pushing that don't benefit our people. They're doing it in Africa, they're doing it in the Americas, they're destroying the Amazon. Uh, and we know that, um, that these are untested. So I, I would say to you that that is the response. Of, this is why we go to the COP. We go to the COP, which, you know, and we, we're on an international stage to force, and we bring our people from all over the Pan-African Climate Justice Alliance and the people from the Americas basically force uh, these, these multinational corporations to come correct. So they have to, you know, we believe that there should be a polluter penalty, right? And that they should be forced um, to... Um, to engage in a way that honors our human rights. So I agree with you that internationally, it's the United States and Asia, totally agree. Uh, but I disagree with you that locally, that our communities are not exposed to more contaminants than privileged communities. <laughs> okay, any last question? Yes, I do. Yes, who's this? Diana. Hi, Diana. Hi. Diana. Hi. Well, I'm going to bring up a very touchy subject, but a subject that I am very passionate about. And that seems to be avoided by almost all the media, politicians, uh, every, everyone. And that is the impact on the climate that agriculture animal agriculture is causing, is doing to the planet. And I am just so sick of it. Um, and, and how it affects people of color. For example, the pig farms in North Carolina, North Carolina is considered to be the pig capital of the world. It is. And mm -hmm. those pig farms are next to people of color, black and brown communities where they're causing health problems like asthma, re other respiratory problems. Um, and the farmers there are conducting illegal sprays onto the land and hurting the land. And of course the humans, the conditions in the farms are horrific for workers who are usually immigrants or also people of color, and of course, horrific for the animals. Mm -hmm. They cause a great deal of emissions. And I have, you know, I, I just watch all the um, documentaries that are based on science and on medicine that um, stand up to that and, and that give all that information. And I'm just, um, I'm just sickened by the fact that nobody ever brings that up. It is a huge, huge problem if we could 
of course, to me, go vegan, because I've been vegan for years. But if we could even just lower the consumption of meat, of poultry, of eggs, of all of those things, it would help the economy. The, the, um, it would just be a, a great uh, advantage to contributing or to lowering the emissions and all the problems that come with uh, the climate. So and you're I want, would like to know, I mean, is that ever going to be uh, something that we can talk about, that we can- That is uh, considered a climate justice it? issue. And Savvy Horn, who is, in, and I think she's in North Carolina, and a number of other organizers that are part of the environmental justice movement have talked about that. Um, we've talked about agriculture and we've talked about um, methane. We've talked about the cathodes and, and what it not only does to the environment, but what it actually does to our health. Uh, yeah. How uh, all of that is passed on to us and how it results in cancer and a lot of other health conditions that we have. Mm -hmm. So that is an integral part of climate justice and it's not siloed, it's not separate. It's an integral part of climate justice. So I agree with you that that is super important. Is it getting the visibility uh, that it deserves and that it merits? You're right, it does not. Um, and it doesn't because the meat industry uh, and the folks that are responsible for that industry have so much lobbying power. They have so many resources that they shut people down. Yes. Um, and so they have a lot of political power, uh, but, it, um, but it's definitely uh, in, uh, important to the climate justice movement. And, and, and I would just say that uh, because you feel passionate about it, you have to lift it and you have to look for support uh, so that you get national platforms and national tables to put a shine and a spotlight on what people may think is a local issue. And the issue of, uh, that you raise in North Carolina is not just, it doesn't stay in North Carolina. That food oh, is distributed course. throughout the country um, and our communities eat it um, and it affects their health. And so uh, it has a national impact. Um, so that, you know, that's a really important, thank you so much for raising that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, it right. doesn't get, it doesn't get the shine it deserves. Mm -hmm. Our very last question, Rosa. Hi, how are you? Sorry, I joined late. I was in another meeting. <laughs> so no. what's um, your question, my love? So I, 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 I feel um, passionate about the environment and not just because I work for the for the Environmental Protection Agency, but I've been working uh, with them for them for the last thirty four years. Wow! Um, you know, I think it starts at home, and I, I find that a lot of Latinos are just not into taking care of our mother nature. I just I just wow. really feel feel very strongly about that because, um, you know, they they they. they they see all these changes that are happening with climate change, but yet, you know, not a lot of people are doing much about it. And, and it just hurts me to see that. And um, as much as I try to like educate my family, educate other people about it, I mean, it's, it's grown into me now because I've, I've been, I, I work for the agency. So what are your thoughts about, you know, how do, how do we, how do we, educate people more, not just Latinos, but in general. But I think Latinos need more of this mm. education. So Rosa, um, studies show that most Latinos believe that there's climate change and that most Latinos care about Mother Earth. What they don't know is what to do about the crisis and what to do about the challenge, and how to engage. And so, um, but in terms of caring um, of all uh, the, the people in the United States, the number of Latinos who are concerned about climate change and, uh, and about the environment is actually, it's highest among Latinos. It's mm -hmm. higher than African-Americans, it's higher than whites, it's higher, it is the highest. And so, uh, so there is a lot of concern. I think people think, think about what happens in our community because I think about it every day. Mm -hmm. um, if you're in a community where someone is working two or three jobs and then they have to come home to take care of their children, the last thing they want to do is come to a meeting. The only time they'll come to a meeting is if their education, if the education of their children is being threatened, if somehow they feel immediately threatened by something, whether it's an ICE raid, whether it's police brutality, they will show up for that because they are being per personally affected. 
With climate change and environment, it seems a little bit more distant in terms of their engagement and given the challenges that they have. And so in order to engage them, you have to make it easy for them. And so uh, what we do is we consider ourselves people who staff the community, that while they're in school and we're listening to them and, and identifying what their priorities are, yeah. and while they're in school, while they're at, at work, we are doing the work for them, right? But the way that we engage them is by being available really early in the morning and going to schools early in the morning, being available in the evening, being available on Saturdays. Yeah. We don't think of this as a job. We think of this as a life. This is our life. We get funded to do it, thankfully. We get to do to get a salary for the thing we live, we love, but it is a life and not and not a job. And so uh, with the EPA, EPA has not uh, had a history of meaningfully engaging communities. What they do is they create the solutions and then they come and they present them to the communities. And then they say that they've engaged the community meaningfully. I was the chair of the National Environmental Justice Advisory Council under Obama for yeah. EPA. And I can tell you how challenging it was mm -hmm. to be able to even talk about climate change within the NEJAC. And so when they went out to communities, the communities would come out. I, I remember this like it was yesterday. We had indigenous communities that lived downwind from radioactive uh, facilities, and they wanted to shut down the hearing and not listen to them. People mm -hmm. who had lost family to that. So, so EPA, uh, and it depends, different regions handle it differently, right? So I can't you know, right, say right. that they're all yeah. the same. But the truth is that Latinos care. They just don't know how to engage and their lives are complicated because to make a living, they have to hold on so much and they're being threatened in so many different ways. Yep. Think about COVID, they lost their homes, they lost their jobs and they lost their family. And so if you had to have them choose between providing financial security for their family and growing a garden or going to a protest on environmental justice, they, our job is to let them know that environmental justice is about their family, mm -hmm. is about the survival of their future, that they're not going to be able to provide a future for their families unless they engage. And we need to make it easier for people who are struggling, uh, but we first have to recognize without judging them that the threats are multiple and, yeah. that, they're, and that they are daily choosing how they're going to engage. And this, so, this administration is really focused on environmental justice. The, the new administration. So yes and, so yes and no. So yes and no. <laughs> right? Yeah. So so they have Justice 40. And so they're providing funding for infrastructure and investments. But at the same time, they're doubling down on false solutions. And they're working with corporations um, in a way that hurts our communities. And so there's no consistency. And so today the Climate Justice Alliance was marching in front of the White House, protesting the Biden administration because they're supporting pipelines that they really should have shut down. Um, so you can't have it both ways. Uh, and this administration is really trying uh, to apply neoliberal solutions to climate change, which mm -hmm. is unconventional, really requires bold action, bold aggressive action. And so I, I would say that um, I'm hoping and praying that, uh, that they will come correct and that they will do right and will recognize that this is not a time for compromise. This right. is a time for bold action because literally our survival is at stake. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And they know- I'd love to have you come on, come on and do a talk at my agency because maybe they need to hear a few of your um, wait, uh, rude awakening uh, speech. <laughs> my, mo my mom calls EPA EPA. I am flying to Miami to see my mom uh, tomorrow uh, because she's not well and so I have to pack um, and um, so um, I'm gonna I'm gonna say bye to you all because um, thank you, you know, talk. my mom is 80 and um, and I just oh, I, 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 need to, I need to see I need to see how she's living she has everything that she needs and I need to 